Thank you, everybody, for coming. It's a pleasure, a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about the, what I keep calling the new public humanities program. It's actually been around for four years now. Uh, this is a program that is uh, trying to do new things to connect the university with the community, with arts, with culture, and with, with training students in a new way for, for a more practical way than usual, perhaps, for Brown but a, um, a way of, of that gets them into the real world. What I'm going to be doing today is talking about the program and then talking about some of the uh, projects that the students have done. Mostly I'm going to talk about the projects. Um, briefly, I'll start with a picture of this building, which I'll come back to throughout the, the talk. Uh, this is the Nightingale Brown House, 1792 building. Uh, the, ancestral home of the Brown family, the Nicholas Brown family that Brown is named after. Um, the generation of the Browns that lived there last was there through the 1980s. So some of you may well have, have known uh, John Nicholas Brown or Anne King Salver Brown. Um, the center is in this building. We, our job is to connect students and faculty to arts and culture. That, that's our big job. Um, we do it in a variety of ways. Let me give you a little bit about the history of the house just to, to give you some context. This is the earliest picture of the house, an 1803 drawing by a schoolgirl, back when <laughs> kids really knew, knew how to draw. Uh, and there, of course, is Nicholas Brown, the fellow who Brown is named after. Uh, he gave $5,000 to Brown, and they named the school after him, which shows you something about inflation. One of the things we have in, in the archives of the center uh, the, the Brown family papers is the receipt, a little lovely little drawing that he got in exchange for, for his gift to Brown. So it's always a, a nice thing to point out. House changed over time in a variety of ways. These are drawings from the 1860s. The carriage house was added on to the back. Um, this is interior of the building in the 1890s, a very heavy Victorian sort of place. Um, the reason I'm showing you all these pictures is because the building is the center of what we do in many ways. And so knowing about the history and thinking about how it connects with the area around it is something that we think about a lot. John Nicholas Brown, uh, who was on the board of Brown, he was uh, under secretary of the Navy, uh, did a lot in World War II, uh, finding art. Uh, fascinating fellow and in some ways an inspiration to our program. A few more pictures of the Brown family uh, in the house. A couple more pictures. Uh, Anne Brown is the famous Brown for having collected toy soldiers. I'm sure some of you have seen over in the John Hay Library on the third floor her collection of toy soldiers, a spectacular collection of, of toy soldiers and pictures of soldiers, all of which was in the house. Uh, this is the house in the 1980s. Uh, the story that most people know about the house is that it was in pretty rough shape uh, in the 1980s and it was completely renovated and turned into a building that could be a, a center uh, for, for, for the university. Uh, the story that many of you may have heard is about this desk. This is the famous $12 million desk. Uh, this desk, John, uh, excuse me, Nick Brown sold the desk in, in order to, um, to put the money into fixing up the house and then to endow the center. So that's the desk. A copy of it was made, it's sitting in the house now. I introduce all the students to it because they should know about the, the, where, the, where the funding came from. So the house in the, in the early 90s <coughs> was done over to look as it looked roughly in the 1920s to, to 1950s. Elegant house. It was open for a while, some of you may remember, as a historic house museum. Uh, but in the early, 20th, early 21st century, when I got there in 2005, it was sort of not clear what, what, was, what should be done with the house. And that, that's when we invented the Public <coughs> Humanities Program in order to take this house to good advantage, to take advantage really of the long history of the Brown family. So John Nicholas Brown in some ways is in some ways an inspiration for our, for our program. He was trained in museums at Harvard. He was in the famous museum course at Harvard. And uh, he was born in 1900, so in about 1920 or so, he was uh, the famous museums course at Harvard trained just about every art museum director in the country for, for 50 years. Um, very interested in historic preservation. I'll come back to this later. Uh, but much of the Benefit Street that we know today is based on uh, 
the encouragement that John Nicholas Brown gave, gave to that work. Uh, what we now call community cultural development, uh, keeping the, the community uh, alive through arts and culture, something he did. Uh, he was certainly an entrepreneur. He invented, was one of the founders of the Providence Preservation Society, the uh, Preserve Rhode Island. A uh, lot of these organizations he was involved with and, and the family was involved with. He worked in uh, what we now call arts management. He worked in what we can now call arts in the public sphere. Uh, he was on the board of the Smithsonian and the board of the Art Museum at Harvard, uh, at RISD. Uh, and he was very interested in archaeology. Um, we do all of those kinds of things. And a, whoops, sorry, I went a little bit too fast. Um, well, I will tell you what we do without showing this, because I, I do it all the time. The, uh, let me just move ahead. So we have a master's degree program in public humanities, the only one in the country, although there are a couple more starting up soon. Yale is about to start a program, so Brown is leading on this. Two-year program for people who are interested in working in museums, in historic preservation, uh, in arts organizations. Um, we are, we take about 10 students each year. We've been going now for four years. We do a lot of courses. We do seminars, we do conferences, um, both for students at Brown and also for professionals from throughout the area and around the country. We have a lot of organizations that we work with. We work with organizations in town and then we have a variety of internships and fellowships for students to, to work in the, around Providence area and again around the country as, as we branch out. Uh, we are interested in students having this combination of practical skills and academic skills. So we want them to be able to think about what it means to work with community. What is community? What is culture? What does it mean to curate a collection? We want them to know about a content. If you're going to be working in an art museum, where many of our students want to end up, you need to know art history. Uh, we want them to know about how people learn outside of school, uh, how people learn in art museums, how people learn and all those in what we now call informal education. Story gathering, storytelling, a lot of oral history work, and a lot of what's now called digital storytelling, the, the hot new field of how to tell stories online over the web. Mm -hmm. Practical management skills, absolutely essential for somebody working in these areas. Cultural policy, cultural heritage policy. We work a lot with the Joukowsky Institute here at Brown, uh, the Archaeology Institute. They're interested in reaching out to the to teaching their students about cultural heritage. It's not enough to be a, just know how to do archaeology anymore. You have to know the policy that's around it. Uh, how we do it, focused very heavily on student work, uh, but working with organizations outside all the time. Uh, we try to teach our students to be collaborative, and we try to have real projects that are sustained and ongoing that students have to actually get things done on time. They have to work in groups. Um, one of the challenges that I found coming from the Smithsonian to, to a university, uh, academics work by themselves most of the time. They, deadlines are different. Budgets are different. Um, teaching students to work as they're going to have to work in the real world seems like an important thing for us to do. So let me go back to the house. We have this spectacular 18th century house full of wonderful furniture. What can we do with it? Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is to use the house as a classroom, as an educational tool. So we have this wonderful Newport furniture. We then take it, and some of these have these wonderful notes inside of it. We teach students how to look at historic furniture. We teach students how to open things up, uh, to learn the history from the things. The, the wallpaper in the house is this wonderful 1830s wallpaper although it's really 1980s wallpaper because it was replaced, but it was from the original blocks. So we actually can spend some time looking at the, learning about the history through the artifacts in the house. That's something that we're interested in. We also learn a lot about local history in the house. Um, there's a lot that we'll go into on that. We've trying to teach the students this basic sense of here's the historic stand, here's the, the history, but we're also trying to get them to think about it in new ways. Uh, historic house museums, in some ways, are, are a, a tired institution. They need to be reinvented, and we're working a lot on how to reinvent historic house museums. One of the things that the students did was these site-specific installations. They curated 
artists to come into the house and to, to do artworks <coughs> that are inspired by the house. Uh, these are some of the, the projects. Uh, it's complicated to explain in the pictures, but small interventions in the house that make you look more closely at the history. So they're new and old at the same time. I should say this is still on exhibit through the end of October. If you'd like to come by, you'd be welcome to come take a look at it. Uh, it's not enough just to do these art installations. Uh, many of the students are interested in teaching kids about history, about kids about art. And so in some of the students here um, did an entire educational program that brought elementary school kids into the house to, to look at some of these things, to, to understand both the history and the art. Uh, some wonderful projects. Another of the projects in the house, this one's a little bit hard to explain. It's based on the collection of formal portrait draw up photographs of the Brown family that are in the archives of the house. And uh, the artist went back and explored where those all came from and did this, this installation of them. Uh, and I couldn't use this, pic this picture. The, the two students on the stairs over there who curated the exhibit and then the two artists there in the, in the front with the flowers. So um, another thing we've done, and this is again trying to experiment with ways in which historic house museums can be a little bit livelier. A uh, playwright from New York who graduated from Brown playwriting program a few years ago uh, named Molly Rice, came and taught a class in the house teaching students to write plays based on the history of the house or based on imaginations of the history of the house and also of the John Brown house across the street. And then over the course of three nights, these performances were put on uh, that were actually in the house. You had to walk, follow this, this uh, follow this, the, the, art, the actors through the house as they, they do, did these performances. It was just delightful. Um, really gave you a sense of what Brown students can do when they're let loose and, and let, uh, how imaginative they can be and how moving some of these performances were, um, some about the history of the house or, or how funny some of the performances were too. They went outside the house, they also went into the gardens and did some wonderful work in the, in the neighborhood as well. One last thing one of the students did, John Nicholas Brown, was in Egypt in 1923. After he graduated, he went on a trip. And it turned out, if you think um, 1923, he was at King Tut's tomb when it was opened, it turned out, just by, by coincidence. And he took amazing pictures that nobody had ever seen before of the opening of King Tut's tomb. And one of the students did this wonderful web, web project, web exhibition of uh, John Nicholas Brown's um, uh, uh, pictures and his scrapbooks that he took of it. So that's the, the house. So we use the house in all those interesting ways, trying to make it um, an educational tool for students. It's not just the house, so the students are interested in all of these topics and there are no end of places around Brown that are great to explore to learn more about these things. So the Anne Brown Memorial, some of you may have walked by there about two years ago, when we decorated it, I was amazed Brown let me do this, but uh, we had, this is a famous painting of, um, called Peel and His Museum. Peel is really the inventor of the, uh, the first, the owner and proprietor of the first American museum. And he had this, he painted this wonderful picture of himself um, opening up the curtain and revealing the, his museum behind him. And this is, I guess in, in the museum world, this is the fa most famous painting of of museums. And so we put that on the front and the students did an exhibition in the, in the building that was called From AA to Zouave, Collections at Brown. It was the 100th anniversary of the Anne Marie Brown Memorial and the library and turns out there are collections all over Brown. Uh, wonderful things that nobody knows about. In the library, in art galleries, in departments, Brown has a huge butterfly collection. Who knew? Uh, has a herbarium. It has amazing things. And the students tracked these all down they put together this exhibition. They learned how to do an exhibition. There were audio tours. There were labels. Uh, they got the materials from the library. Some of you may know that Brown has one of the best stamp collections in the world. Um, not used very much by students, but we, we put all these collections to use. Art collections from the Bell Gallery, the toy soldiers I mentioned in the back there. Uh, the students did a, we have a, in John Nicholas Brown Center actually has a large collection of uh, dance 
costumes uh, from the 1920s and 30s from the, uh, the new dance group. So the students put this all together. We had a great party for the opening. Uh, they had to figure out how to organize it. They had to figure out what the best questions were. They were each given a certain space. They had to work with the, uh, with the curators and the librarians to figure out what to display, uh, whether it's swords or the, the dolls. Again, they're amazing things all at Brown. Um, they had to come up with exhibit titles, which was a fascinating, exper um, fascinating ex exercise. And they did an amazing job. They came up with some great ideas. They wrote labels for each of these collections. The odd letters across the top. Um, one of the things curators need to know how to do is how to categorize things. So we had these absolutely impossibly diverse categories. And the, uh, they came up with a group of about 10 different categories. Actually, I'll go back. Um, changing the world. Uh, iconic object. Um, uh, not sure what the others are anymore, but that kind of thing. They, they came up with these wonderful categories and then assigned each, each uh, collection a couple of these categories. So whether it was the great magic collection or the Alcoholics Anonymous collection, which Brown has, um, amazing stuff. Another student project, uh, the Brown Student Radio was, had I guess it's, must have been its 100th anniversary um, a few years back, and the student did a collected a lot of material, um, built an exhibition, did a website. The Modernist Journals Project is another ongoing project at Brown uh, about the 1920s and the, the, the small journals that people published in. Pulp Fiction, um, playing off of the H.P. Lovecraft, Providence Connections. Again, just wonderful collections um, based on classes, based on uh, individual faculty or student interests. And what the students do in, basically in, in classes like this is instead of writing a paper individually, they work together to uh, do an exhibition. This exhibit opened last year. Uh, Paul Buell's class pulled it together. Uh, and it's actually our most successful. And it's been traveling all over the country. It was at the National Yiddish Book Center. It's in Arizona right now. Uh, they did a really good job. And so we've sort of gone into the traveling exhibit business a little bit. Uh, Day of the Dead Altar uh, with community groups in Manning Chapel over here at the part of the Hoffenraffer Museum. An exhibit on slave uh, portraits of slaves by an artist in Connecticut. Um, again, lots of student interest. They learn how to do these things, and they learn how to work together to make this happen. So, so far I've talked about the house and about Brown, the most, the, where we've been putting most of our effort lately is in working with the community around Brown. And this is an interesting challenge for us. Um, it's always scary when you're letting students represent Brown to the, to the, to the community. There's lots of history there, lots that, we need to, to, that they need to learn about how to do that. But it's also what's become the most important part of museum work lately is to have the museum work with the community. It's not just a museum curator saying, this is the history, come and look at it. It's building that history, making that history part of a conversation between the, the curator and the community and making it into a, a bigger, more interesting story that way. Getting, getting the, the people that, that are being talked about into the story. So we've done a variety of projects. And Providence, of course, with all of its wonderful history, is the perfect place to do this. Um, so right down the street is the Stephen Hopkins House um, that's owned by the Society of Colonial Dames. Uh, they were delightful and encouraged us, one of our students, to work on a new interpretation that wasn't just about Stephen Hopkins, but was about his family and about the slaves who lived there. I, if I remember right, there were seven slaves who lived in the house with Stephen Hopkins and his wife and three or four children. And they, were, they had the student do some, some really good research and rewrite some of the stories. This is a, still a work in progress, but it's, a, um, it's an example of, of the, the ways that students can work with community organizations. Last year, I guess just about a year ago, at Waterfire for the 200th anniversary of the abolition of the transatlantic slave trade, some of my students 
worked with the folks at Waterfire, worked with Barnaby Evans, to in create a new ritual as part of Waterfire. At the end there, the, um, they, oops, let me go back a little bit. The, um, to, to make a ritual of light and water and a libation that was a way of acknowledging this 200th anniversary of, of, the slave tra of the end of the slave trade as part of this ongoing celebration. One of the things I'm fascinated by is the way in which um, rituals shape society. And in, while anthropologists and sociologists might study that, what I'm hoping to do is to train my students to make new rituals. Uh, so there's a way of reaching out and saying there's an ongoing ritual, fortunately it wasn't repeated this year, that would have been a new ritual as part of Water Fire that, that expands the story a little bit. Uh, we've got students working all over the city this semester. Jane Lancaster, who some of you may know, is teaching a course on local history, getting students into all the local archives, whether it's the Athenaeum or the state and city archives, and starting to really get a sense of how, how you do local history. What are the issues that you should worry about? A uh, good number of undergraduates in that class and it's really been a uh, delight to see them get so fascinated and quick, so quickly understand some of the complexities of, uh, of local history. A uh, project that was done a couple of years ago called Underground Rhode Island, based on a very extensive set of oral histories done by undergraduates of artists in Rhode Island, artists in, mostly in Providence. Um, the students did oral histories they collected pictures, they wrote exhibit labels like this, and they did this wonderful space that was both, you can get a sense of the feel of it, that all these glowing pictures, but also it was full of sounds uh, based on the oral histories that they had collected. Uh, the biggest project that we've been working on now is, is the Fox Point project. And this is a whole set of interconnected stories and collections and exhibitions and library projects and now digital projects tied to Fox Point, which of course is the area right behind, um, right behind Brown, right next to Brown. So just to give you a little sense of how this ties back to the house and how this is perfect for us, this is 1960 or so. This is, is the Nightingale Brown House where we're located. And this is, is Benefit Street and then North Main uh, about 50 years ago. So this is the area that, that the, the neighborhood that the house was part of. And then Fox Point starts from here and goes on over. Fox Point was very uh, heavily Cape Verdean, Azorian, Irish in the, from about 1890 up through the 1960s. And it was really the, the Browns, Browns neighborhood. And we are going back and working with that community, um, many of whom have moved away, of course, and trying to document that story. Uh, some of the people who lived in Fox Point in the from about 1940 to the 1960s. Um, some of these folks we've gotten to know fairly, fairly well. Uh, they're still around, they come to visit all the time. Um, so Brown has a long history of working with, with Fox Point, not always in a good way. So <laughs> it's, um, it's been a interesting um, exercise to go back and talk to some of these people. So. Some people will remind, remind us that Brown built this boathouse where there used to be the oyster packing uh, factory. And the sociologists like to do research down in Fox Point. It was very easy for them. Uh, of course, there are some uh, good things as well. The Varshan Gregorian Elementary School is, uh, I think, probably the, one of the key social centers in Fox Point, the Early Childhood Education Center, the Community Garden. So it's this interesting history that students are partaking of and, and being part of when they go and uh, work with the Fox Point community. The place we started all of this was with oral history. Uh, Annie Valk, who is the associate director of the center, has, is an oral historian by, by training. And she set up a pretty extensive program as a class project to interview people in the neighborhood who, who had lived in the neighborhood and to collect their stories. And these are being digitized or online. The library is working very closely with us on it. As part of that, 
uh, they built a photo, photo project as well. And this is, this is a project that just astonished me. I, I told them it would never work. Um, instead of doing the traditional, we just collect the photos, what they've done is work with some uh, local amateur historians in the community to build a Flickr site on the internet using Flickr to, to upload images of these, of the, the uh, pictures of, you know, old family pictures. And there are now 9,000 pictures of Fox Point on Flickr. Um, we've gotten some wonderful student papers out of it. My favorite was the ways in which the community members think about these pictures and the categories that they make on Flickr versus the way the students and thinking as historians make categories of these pictures. Um, the other thing that's so amazing about this to me is that, again, most of the folks that we're talking to are in their 70s and 80s. They're all going on Flickr. Some of them are learning how to use computers for the first time to go on to see these pictures and to write comments on them. So they're going back and they're identifying all the people in these pictures. And we know every time there's been a funeral of one of the old Fox Pointers because suddenly a whole new group of people is coming on to, to identify more people. And uh, it's sort of amazing how uh, well this, this project has worked. Um, and it's, uh, it's perfect outreach for all the folks who are no longer living in Fox Point. We've done a lot of work with the Vartan Gregorian Elementary School. It's a wonderful school. It's not only wonderful because it's so close that students can get there right away, but uh, it's a very easy school to work with. So the students, some of my students worked with the students, the sixth graders, to do an exhibition at the school. Uh, they did an open house. Uh, they did this fascinating thing where they took the oral histories, turned them, the students wrote plays based on the oral histories. The students took the historic photographs, went out, we gave them cameras, they went out and took new photographs to add to the historic photographs. It's just this whole wonderful way of getting the students to think about the history. There's a new project that we're working on. Yeah. In the last picture. Sure. Are those children hanging? Or <laughs> <laughs> what we did, these two, I'll show you. This is the same picture. Oh, that's a different picture. The, uh, what we did is we took some of the old photographs and blew them up to life size. Oh, okay. And so these are actually kids were sitting on a stoop or something. <laughs> and, but we decided that having them life size made all the difference. So we could get this wonderful picture like this of these kids from, a, from an old photograph. And then, you know, the kids today being the same height, just, you know, with them. Um, it was just delightful to see the way that, and then what happened, uh, we have some uh, pictures. Folks would come by and find themselves in the pictures, of course. And so this is Johnny Costa, who is this guy right here. So, you know, it's just this, this connections that get formed were just wonderful. And I guess this is actually the, the, um, the former mayor's grandson, I guess. So, you know, it's a small, it's, Providence is a small town. Um, but we got this wonderful, um, we have this wonderful sense of the community sort of being put back together through, through this history, which was something we were just delighted to see. And we got some wonderful coverage in, in, the, uh, in the Providence Journal about, the, about this project. The, uh, another thing we've done, again, I mentioned we were reaching out to, to try to do more and more digital things, um, starting to build what we call memory maps of using Google and the images that we've collected, starting to put those up online so anybody can add their own stories of the neighborhood. So this, this, some of this is taken from the oral histories, added to maps, and you start to be able to build these online exhibits that you, you could never do any other way. Um, one of the couple of the students took this and developed something called the Digital History Toolbox, which is an easy way for other organizations, for small historical societies, to, do, to use exactly these tools. So we're trying to reach out beyond just the neighborhood, but using the neighborhood. The, the last project I'll talk about, and the, the, the biggest one, is an exhibition that students in my class did last year called Remember the Old Times, Cape Verdean Community in Fox Point. In the house, in, our, in, our, in, the John, in the Nightingale Brown House, there's a carriage house that we've turned into an exhibition space. And you saw some of the spaces earlier. Uh, what this class did was to research the history of the area using the pictures that had been collected on Flickr, using the, what local historians had collected, uh, doing a lot of new interviews with people. Uh, they went out, collected objects, and built an exhibition. 
I mentioned earlier we'd like students to have real budgets and real deadlines and work with, with, with professionals. We hired a professional designer who told them they had to meet their deadlines, and they did. Um, and we, they worked how to organize the exhibition. They came up with the, the key elements, some, some possible names for the exhibition. Uh, they wrote, uh, they did research in the census. This is the, the census for, for part of Fox Point from 1930. They went back and tried to recreate the neighborhood through it. Um, and they did this absolutely charming exhibition, um, which is, this is the entrance to it. You see these uh, two girls welcoming you into the, into the space. Um, they wrote some very nice exhibition labels. One of the, the skills that they get out of the class is not only how to organize all of this, but to do the writing and, and to choose the images. They wrote some wonderful press releases and some, some um, material to advertise the exhibition. Um, they, they did a professional job. They figured out how to organize it. I mentioned earlier they, the street, um, the port. The, of course, the port was very important. Um, the bar uh, was, for at least for the guys in Cape Verde and Fox Point, was a key place. Uh, it was interesting to see some of the conversations that went on between the students and some of the folks in the community. What stories each of them thought was important to tell, which stories they thought shouldn't be told. So there are many people, or some people anyway, in the community who said, don't talk about bars. We don't want to remember that part of the story. <coughs> that was mostly the women who said that. The guys they talked to said, bars were the most important place. That was where the longshoremen would wait for work. That was, you know, that was a social site. And so they had to negotiate what sometimes got to be a pretty complicated um, process of working with community members to tell their story. Who had the final say is a question that, that people wonder about, and it's a negotiation. And that skill, I think, is, is a very important skill for students to learn, how to negotiate, to, to make stories happen, to make projects happen when not everybody agrees. Uh, the street section is a little bit washed out there. There's actually a video projected here of, of images from the street. The bar again. Um, music, very important. The whole exhibit is full of, of, of Cape Verdean music, which is, is really quite nice. Uh, they, had to, they had to negotiate with various organizations to borrow these instruments, uh, borrow images. They learned a lot out of it, I think. Uh, community life. Uh, a fascinating project. They put in a map at the end. Again, I was a little bit skeptical about that, whether this would work. Uh, and it's a map of, of Fox Point with all these little stick, um, with push pins and, and tags. And you can put down where, you know, tell your story about this place. And, and because it's the people who are visiting the exhibit are both you know, old time Fox Pointers and students, you get, you know, I lived in this house in, in, in 1942, and also this is where I live now. So you have this fascinating sense of the ongoing history and, and the connections that get, get formed. Uh, we recreated as well as we could this small bit of a Cape Verdean home. Um, and then we had a wonderful exhibit opening where we invited both the students and the, the Cape Verdeans who you know, grew up there or whose parents had grown up there to a big party at the, at the center. And this brings me back to, to the house and to the, to the end of the, to back to the beginning of, of the talk really. Uh, the house was a, people from Fox Point knew about the house, but they were never allowed into it. This was you know, the other side of the tracks. This was, was uh, the big rich house up on the hill. Now suddenly they're back in the house. They're invited in, they do the oral history work there. They're, they came, they were invited to this exhibition. The ambassador from Cape Verde came to the opening of the exhibition too, which was very nice. And the story in some ways is complete. That not only is, are the students learning about this history, but in some small way, we're, we're repairing that connection between Brown and the community. So I think that point I will end. That's about a half hour. Let me just end by saying, come and visit. We've got those three exhibitions that are up right now through the end of October. Um, we have a RISD class that will be doing an exhibition, I think, in December and January, actually a class on science and art. So I'm curious to see what they do. And then uh, a couple of other projects over the course of the, 
of the of the year. So, and we always advertise in the um, in the brown calendar, so it's easy to find. It. So come and visit. Uh, you'll see some interesting things, and if nothing else, it's a beautiful house to come visit. Thank you very much. Thank you.